Donald Trump appeared under oath yesterday in that big civil fraud trial. It's a train wreck, but that's to be expected when your testimony coach is Robert De Niro. Unbelievable. This is the mop-up for November 7th, 2023. Happy birthday, Hannah Banana. I'm David Feldman. Please like this episode, share it, and leave a comment. Don't forget to subscribe to my channel. Donald Trump took the stand in his New York State civil lawsuit where he has already been found guilty of defrauding banks, insurance companies, and the United States government. We needed a trial to figure that one out? I grew up in New York. Why don't you just ask me? I could have saved you a lot of time and money. I also grew up in New Jersey, and Trump always reminded me of Tony Soprano, if Tony Soprano had a little more trouble controlling his appetites. I think the Trumpanos, I think the Trumpanos will end just like the Sopranos. I think there's going to be all this tension and then suddenly a smash cut to black and everybody's going to say, that's it? Like, if he loses Iowa and New Hampshire and is no longer a threat to our republic, it's just going to end. Fade to black. Smash cut to black. And we're just going to look at each other and go, what, what was that? Does that make any sense? That thing we just went through for nine years? I guess. Okay, next. Trump's testimony was chaotic, rambling, and hostile. So all in all, it was a quiet business day in Trump world. Hey, any day is a good day when one of Trump's followers doesn't storm the courtroom and spread their own feces all over Lady Justice's bare breasts. Donald Trump continued to adamantly insist Mar-a-Lago was worth half a billion dollars and not the $18 million he adamantly insists it's worth when it comes time each year to pay taxes on it. Trump told the judge this trial was such a sham and a scam, he couldn't believe he and his own family weren't in on it. Trump spent four hours on the stand in a discursive testimony that jumped from topic to topic as he free associated, failing to answer the questions asked. The judge at one point admonished Trump reminding him that this wasn't one of his political rallies. And Trump said, I know it's not a Trump rally because everyone here has a high school diploma and the place doesn't smell like warm beer and bratwurst farts. I don't think he said that. At one point on the stand, Donald Trump noticed the courtroom was at full capacity. He turned to the judge and said, I got twice the crowd the son of Sam, David Berkowitz, drew. Then Trump boasted that lonely, crazy women are already trying to be his prison pen pal, and he hasn't even been sentenced yet. After the testimony, Trump's lawyer, Chris Kyes, told reporters, quote, In 33 years, I have never had a witness testify better. An absolutely brilliant performance. Yes, the key word being performance. That's, uh, that's how Trump picks his lawyers, by how obsequious they are. Trump lost the case, but he kept this lawyer because this lawyer kept flattering him. Mr. President, I spoke to the warden. He said in 33 years of running Leavenworth, nobody ever made a grilled cheese sandwich on a prison cell radiator like you do, Mr. President. Mr. President... The warden told me nobody cries for his mommy like you do when you're getting gang banged in the shower by your Secret Service detail. They have to go to prison with him, by the way. After Trump raised his right hand and swore to tell the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth, so help me Trump, he handed the judge a disclaimer that read, do your own research. Buyer beware. I'm warning you up front. Don't believe a word you hear. This is a worthless clause. That's what we call it. So buyer beware. And then the trial continued. 
Trump's testimony was a little different from the eight-hour deposition for the case earlier this year. During that taped deposition, Trump invoked his right to remain silent 450 times. During yesterday's testimony, Judge Angeron invoked his right to tell Trump to remain silent 450 times. To keep Trump calm and focused, his lawyers made sure to provide him with two computer screens that live streamed the secret security camera he had installed in the ladies' shower room at Mar-a-Lago. That's uh, what calmed him down, the, uh, the live stream of the secret, sur- uh, secret security camera he has installed in the ladies' shower room at Mar-a-Lago. Trump testified that the trial was a complete waste of his time and he had more important places to be, like on trial in Miami for violating the Espionage Act or on trial in Washington, D.C. for trying to overthrow the government of the United States or on trial for running a criminal racket or on trial once again for raping E. Jean Carroll. In Trump's estimation, being tried for fraud, that's like small claims court for him. During his testimony, Trump looked at Judge Arthur Angeron and called him nasty, partisan, angry, and stupid. Usually, those are terms Trump reserves only for women. So I wonder if he thinks Judge Angeron is a girl. I mean, sometimes people get so angry they they don't see properly. Somebody should tell him Arthur Angeron is a man. Trump said to the New York State attorney who was questioning him, Quote, you and every other Democrat coming after me from 15 different sides, you're all haters. Trump hates haters because haters remind Trump of blacks, Jews, Arabs, Hispanics, lesbians, drag queens, socialists, Marxists, the handicapped, the poor, the middle class, and anyone who lives in a trailer park. He's not a hater like those people are. Trump said to Kevin Wallace, who was questioning him for the state of New York, quote, people don't know how good a company I built because people like you are going around demeaning me. Well, Mr. Trump, there's a simple way to prove to the world how good a company you run, and that would be by opening up your books. Oh, right. You can't because they're cooked just like you. Donald, nobody's demeaning your company. Nobody's demeaning Trump org. They're telling the truth. You just find the truth demeaning because everything you touch turns to crap. You got the might ass touch. Then Trump spotted New York State Attorney General Letitia James and snarled, quote, there are murderers here in New York And the attorney general is sitting here all day. Trump knows for a fact there are murderers in New York because he sold them all apartments in Trump Tower. Half that building is either Russian mobsters or narco-terrorists. And those are the friendly neighbors who answer the door on Halloween. Then Trump looked at Judge Arthur Angeron and told the courtroom, quote, This judge will rule against me because he will always rule against me. Yeah, unfortunately, that's usually the case with justices who can't be intimidated or bribed. Trump complained to Judge Engeron that the judge already decided Trump committed fraud, which is true. He's already, the judge has already ruled that Trump committed fraud. And Trump shouted at him, quote, You called me a fraud and you don't even know me. He knows you, Donald. We all know you. What are you thinking? You you think sharing a steak dinner with Judge Engeron while you regale him with all the porn stars you banged is going to make the judge say, you know what? Forget what the financial statements say. This guy is fun. And you know what? He's actually a kind person. He told me that Stormy Daniels had crusty toenails, but he slept with her anyway because he didn't want to hurt her feelings. He's a great guy. No fraud. Case dismissed. I'm really glad I got to know Donald Trump. Trump is obsessed with the judge ruling that Mar-a-Lago is only worth $18 million. 
Trump said, quote, Judge, you can say anything you want about my stupid wife, my stupid, ugly children, or even my dearly departed, racist, boneheaded father. You can call them weak and gutless mental deficients, which I happen to think they all are. You can call my mother a foul-smelling, racist crone, which she most certainly was. But when you attack my Mar-a-Lago, then it's personal. Out of nowhere, later on in the testimony, Trump blurred out, the tennis court alone is worth $18 million. This is true. They were just talking about something else. And then Trump blurted out, the, 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 the tennis court alone is worth $18 million. And Judge Engeron said, what tennis court? And Judge said, the tennis court at Mar-a-Lago, it's worth $18 million. And in all fairness, Trump is right. It is worth $18 million because instead of a clay court, it's made entirely out of Pancho Gonzalez's mummified skin. That's true. This is the mop-up for November 7th, 2023. Happy birthday, Hannah Banana. It's also Election Day 2023. Today is Election Day 2023, where millions of registered voters across this great land of ours say, really? I thought Election Day 2023 is in 2024. Isn't 20, don't we have Election Day 2023 next year? Yes, Election Day 2023, an off-year election year event designed to remind us that as much as we complain about government, it's our fault for not bothering to pay any attention to it. In America, government is a lot like a fish tank. It's exciting to set up, put the fish in, but after a couple of days, we find ourselves losing interest and wondering where that weird fish smell is coming from. Sure, anyone can follow presidential politics every four years, but that's like the football fans who only watch the Super Bowl. Well, today there's no halftime show, no deli spread, no national shared experience, no lost wagers, no hangovers, no police conducting welfare checks on your children because the neighbors heard screaming. In other words, today is no fun. No fun at all. We're doing the heavy lifting on Election Day 2023. We're electing school board members, city comptrollers, and deciding if voting no on yes means we don't not support a bond measure for our schools, or if voting no on yes means we do support not passing a bond measure for our schools. Go ahead and wait till Election Day 2024. Go ahead. As for me, however, Election Day 2023 separates the men from the boys, the women from the girls, the losers who have nothing better to do with their lives from the people who are too busy getting laid. Actually, we have a race for governor of Mississippi today, where Tate Reeves, the Republican incumbent, might lose to Democrat Brandon Presley, who is second cousin to Elvis. And I don't mean Costello or Mitchell, but I'd probably have more respect for the guy if he was related to Elvis Mitchell. I like Elvis Mitchell. Brandon Presley wasn't born with the same, shall we say, charisma as his cousin Elvis, as, as you can see, not too much in the face department. In fact, during his, first tele <laughs> during his first televised debate, the producers were so concerned about the <laughs> home audience's reaction to Brandon's face, they decided to shoot this Presley from the waist down. Little joke for the kids. Then he sang You Ain't Nothing But a Hound Dog to what everybody thought was an actual hound dog, but turned out to be the visiting governor from Arkansas, Sarah Huckabee Sanders. 
We also have a governor's race in Kentucky where the incumbent Democrat Andy Beshear is expected to win a second term running against Republican Attorney General Daniel Cameron. Now, you're probably wondering why Kentucky, which Trump carried by 24 points in 2020, would reelect a Democratic governor. Well, uh, this is uh, this is Republican candidate for governor of Kentucky, Daniel Cameron and his lovely wife. And I wonder why he's not going to win inside a deep red state like Kentucky. I mean, what's not to like? Why shouldn't Republicans love this guy? He's a Republican. He's married. Unlike Tim Scott, he's married to a white woman. His wife is white, but he's not. He's black in Kentucky. Now, one would think that it wouldn't matter with Kentucky Republicans in this day and age that he's black and he's married to a white woman. And it doesn't matter. That's not why Republicans in Kentucky don't like Cameron. No, they couldn't care less that he's a black man married to a white man. They think these Republicans think He's weak on Kentucky's implementation of the net investment surcharge on commodities purchased before 1997. It has nothing to do with his being black and his wife being white. The people of Kentucky, they don't notice that kind of thing. They're just genuinely concerned he's not strong enough on the 3.8% surtax imposed by Section 1411 of Kentucky's Revenue Code on Investment Income. Nothing to do with him being black, her being white, their being in a mixed race relationship. The people of Kentucky they, that sent Mitch McConnell to the Senate, they don't care if he's black or white and what color his wife is. No, they just think... He's weak on raising net-based commodity option surcharges that are being held in irrevocable trusts set aside for retirement accounts. Nothing to do with his being black and his wife being white. He's not going to win because the people of Kentucky, the Republicans of Kentucky, they are concerned. They are deep red fiscal conservatives who live in Kentucky, and they're just concerned. Also, the uh, bad people from the horrible state of Ohio will be voting today on whether to enshrine the right to an abortion in their state constitution and whether to legalize marijuana, which their original state constitution was printed on. Most of you know that constitutions were all printed on hemp up until 150 years ago. The U.S. Constitution was printed on hemp. Our founding document is made of marijuana, which explains Washington, D.C. being our nation's capital. You'd have to have been completely baked to think Washington, D.C. should be our nation's capital, especially when it used to be New York City. But having our nation's capital be New York City made the people of Virginia feel inferior So to make Virginia feel better about themselves, our founding fathers agreed to put the capital of our country in Washington, D.C. And guess what, Virginia? You're still inferior. It didn't take. We moved the capital to Washington, D.C., Virginia, out of New York. You're still inferior. By the way, uh, Virginia, uh, their House of Delegates is also up for re-election today. Uh, But let's go back to our Constitution, Philadelphia. There they all are in Philadelphia, putting the finishing touches on our sacred Constitution. Look at them. George Washington, Ben Franklin, James Madison, the tertiary syphilis in that room alone. Just looking at this painting, I'm getting a contact STD. And boy, did they give us a document as relevant then as it is today. Our nation's charter emerged from their absinthe-soaked minds 
fully formed. And to alter yet a comma of the Second Amendment would be sacrilege. Sure, it would save 50,000 lives each year from unnecessary gun deaths, but it would be sacrilege to change one comma in the Second Amendment. Interesting thing about these guys who penned our Constitution. In order to hold elective office in America, you have to swear an oath to uphold everything they wrote. You swear an oath to the words in their Constitution, not to our country or its people. You swear an oath to obey what these smallpox super spreaders wrote. You don't swear an oath to be kind or charitable, loving or democratic. You swear an oath to obey every single sentence, punctuation mark, and syllable in this thing they vomited out. Man, you think it's hard directing that piece of shit garbage about the Chicago 7 that Aaron Sorkin wrote? These guys are worse than Aaron Sorkin. You cannot, you shall not change a single word. What a bunch of self-dealing, drug-addicted narcissists. I look at these guys who wrote our Constitution the same way I look at the writing room on Everybody Loves Raymond. They didn't invent anything new or different. They caught a cultural wave. There was something in the zeitgeist that made what they did more entertaining than it actually was. America was in the mood for a we the people kind of vibe, and these guys stumbled into something audiences craved at that particular moment. It's a right place at the right time kind of thing. But through time, we get to see what it really is. Time reveals that it's tired, trite, and anodyne. It's rickety and familiar. And I'm not jealous. I'm just saying, like everybody loves Raymond, the Constitution doesn't hold up in syndication. It's of a time and place when people wanted their comedy or their blueprints for democracy to be innocuous and relatable. That's all the Constitution really is. The U.S. Constitution, that's all it is. It's a well-manicured, evenly tempered work of innocuous puffery. Sure, it's better than the Articles of Confederation, which to me was the mad about you of founding documents, just a saccharine knockoff of Seinfeld. Don't get Paul Reiser. He's funny. Why? Because he's not funny. Is that it? I hear he's a nice guy. Don't get it. The thing that annoys me about the United States Constitution, it was written pretty much by the same guys who wrote the Articles of Confederation, which was, as you all know, a gigantic flop. The Articles of Confederation's head writer was John Dickinson, and nobody liked it or him. John Dickinson, I think, was another Harvard prick from The Simpsons. But after going down in flames with the Articles of Confederation, Dickinson lands on his feet, of course, he gets another writing job on the U.S. Constitution, even though he failed miserably with the Articles of Confederation. It's the old boys network. These are not great comedy minds. John Dickinson didn't reinvent the wheel like Larry David. He just, you know, he's derivative. He read other people's constitutions that seem to be working in states like, you know, New York, Massachusetts. And he thought, OK, I'll just lift a couple of ideas, make them my own. I'll write a spec constitution and see if I get any work. It's why most constitutions are unwatchable. They're derivative, and with the laugh track, most Americans have no idea whether they're any good at self-governance. How do we know we're good at self-governance with these effing constitutions and their laugh tracks? They're written, these constitutions are written by a bunch of smug and privileged rich white guys telling the same exact story about our inalienable rights but with different actors. 
It's so formulaic. It's why I don't watch television. These constitutions insult my intelligence. And yes, I'm a little jealous that I wasn't allowed into the club. But seriously, how is it even remotely possible that John Dickinson is a consulting producer on Curb Your Enthusiasm? Larry David, of all people, should know better. The Constitution was written during the Age of Revolution. So people reflexively assume it's revolutionary. But not everything during the Age of Revolution was revolutionary. It's like Donovan at Woodstock. Everybody assumes, oh, it's Woodstock. It's the 60s. There's Donovan. He must be part of the counterculture challenging convention and protesting Vietnam and the slaughter of innocents when he sings Hurdy Gurdy Man. He must be singing, when he sings Hurdy Gurdy Man, he must be singing about capital's dehumanization of the soul when he sings Hurdy Gurdy, Hurdy Gurdy, Hurdy Gurdy, Hurdy Gurdy, Hurdy Gird, Hurdy Gurdy, Hurdy Gurdy, Hurdy Gurdy Gurdy. Yeah, this is all about revolution and change. I really dig Donovan's lyrics. Roly poly, roly poly, holy poly, poly. No, Donovan got booked to play Woodstock. That's all it was. No revolution, just a gig. Same thing with the Constitution. Have you ever read the, the U.S. Constitution? It's nothing but run-on and indec indecipherable sentences. The Constitution has more confused clauses than a Hitler Youth summer camp. The Constitution has more confused clauses than a Hitler Youth summer camp. What happened? Didn't work. Oh, hang on. Let me try that again. The Constitution is more confused clauses than a Hitler Youth summer camp. There is the U.S. Constitution. There's an entire cottage industry that sprung up trying to figure out what these self-satisfied white men meant when they wrote the Constitution. And that cottage industry is called the courts. Had the Constitution been written clearly and succinctly, we wouldn't need a Supreme Court. It's supposedly the greatest document in the entire history of mankind, but for more than 200 years, we've needed hundreds of jurists to argue what exactly it all means. The thing is so poorly written that John Jay, Alexander Hamilton, and James Madison, who wrote the Constitution, also had to write the Federalist Papers to explain what was in their magnum opus. Have, have you read the Federalist Papers? The entire purpose of the Federalist Papers was to have the guys who wrote the Constitution explain what's in the Constitution. And then you read the Federalist Papers, written by the same people who wrote the Constitution, and you realize, no wonder the Constitution makes no sense. These guys don't know how to write. Someone needs to write a Federalist Papers for the Federalist Papers to explain what the hell is in that stilted boatload of obfuscation. Can we own guns or not? No, 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 you say. These, these were young, angry, revolutionary children of the Enlightenment in their 20s. Our, our founding fathers were young, revolutionaries. They were rebels filled with the loftiest of ambitions to turn the world upside down. Yes, they were radicals who believed our freedoms originate within ourselves, just so long as you weren't black, female, Native American, or too poor to own land. Essentially, what these so-called revolutionaries came up with was a blueprint for the richest and whitest men in America to maintain all their power. Wow, that's never been done before. So let me get this straight. 
a group of wealthy white landowners, some who own slaves, many who own slaves, they got together in Philadelphia and wrote a document to guarantee that wealthy white landowners, many of whom who own slaves, shall dictate how the other 95% of America lives and dies. The wealthiest 5% of America shall decide who we go to war with, what our taxes should be spent on, and who should benefit from the nation's raw materials and who should have their raw materials stolen from them. Our founding fathers invented that all by themselves. Geniuses. Nobody ever came up with that idea before. The Constitutional Convention. Wow. Our founding fathers all gathered in one room. Amazing. Not since Brian Wilson dined alone. The point I'm making is, here in America, today is Election Day 2023. Vote. Pretend you know what the issues are and vote. Get out there and vote. Pretend you know what you're voting on. You know, check with Bernie or Ralph Nader, see if they're for or against it. Or if the name has a D next to it, take your chances. It probably means it's a Democrat or a douchebag if there's any difference. I'm David Feldman reminding you to stay strong and protect the weak. All right. Thank you for listening to this nonsense. Uh, Please like this. Please share it. Please subscribe to my channel. Please, uh, please hit the like. Uh, Thank you to the mods in the chat room. Thank you, Bob. Uh, What else? I'm forgetting something. Vote. In all seriousness, vote. Uh, And register to vote next year. Maybe your last chance. I'm forgetting something. I'm supposed to ask you to like this, share it via social media, and uh, or in, in an email, subscribe to my channel, subscribe to my newsletter. I forgot something. I didn't get any sleep today. All right. I'll see everybody at 12.05 a.m. tomorrow. Please vote.